Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you uh, do you all see my screen now? Not yet. Does it? Can you? Is the is the screen that I have? Is it showing or not? No, yeah, just the face. Okay. Let me see. Um. Oh wait, that's I didn't actually click screen share. I just clicked the presentation. That that, that would be why. Um. <laughs> okay. Working. Okay. Present. Now, now you should be able to see it. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So this is my um, presentation I put together about understanding, kind of about understanding the legislative process in Massachusetts, um, and why it, it, in many ways, is intentionally complicated. Okay. So, as outlined on on the new website in the Beacon Hill uh, 101, se uh, 101 section. Uh, it begins with a little semblance of a legislative timeline of basically talking about the start of the legislative session, um, kind of the committee process, budget season, when a bill actually gets to the floor, and what happens after a, a bill uh, a bill passes. I'm going to go through each of these parts individually. Um, work, and then for the just a quick overview, timeline of a legislative session, it starts the, f the first Wednesday in January, and it runs tip it runs theoretically to the to the Tuesday before the first Wednesday of the next odd like of the next odd numbered year. Sorry, of the next odd numbered year. In practice, it's typically July thirty first of an even numbered year, because in Unlike the, this past year was somewhat of an anomaly due to COVID, where the legislature did go all the way up until the very last minute. Um, typically, the legislative session ends on July 31st. And as a, just a quick bit of, to use that for a quick bit of terminology, what tends to end on July 31st is the formal legislative session. So sometimes if you're talking to a legislator, you'll hear them talk about a formal session and an informal session. A formal session is when they're in the chamber and they're taking votes and they're debating things. An informal session is what happens all of those other days, right? Because they don't, they're not in there voting every day of the week. The House tends to only be voting on Wednesdays and the Senate on Thursdays. And other days, they still might take up legislation, but they're typically taking up non-controversial bills that are passing by what's called unanimous consent. Now that, and that's, if you remember back into the beginning of the pandemic, that's how the, the legislature operated in an informal session for, for a few months, because just passing things that were uncontroversial because with unanimous consent, it operates under the principle that nobody present objects. That doesn't mean that everybody supports it. It just means nobody shows up to oppose it. And they eventually came to a head when they wanted to do something and that the Repu that you had a single Republican there to say, no, we're not doing this. And in order to actually override that, you need everybody in the chamber. So that's kind of kind of one of the one of the kind of the key distinctions. And that'll come up again in some of the, the stuff that I'll talk about later. But OK, okay. start of, uh, if you can mute, I think I heard myself echoing from somebody. Uh, so if you can mute during this, unless you want to chime in with a specific question. Uh, so start of the legislative session. As I noted, that's January uh, in, your, in your odd numbered years. Typically, the bill filing deadline is also in January. You may have noticed that got extended a month this year due, due to Due to kind of the how late they finished the last legislative session, but it's typically a very rapid start to the legislative session, uh, where almost the vast majority of the bills that will be filed in the entirety of the two-year legislative session are filed in that very beginning of, of the session. Um, it's also when committees get assigned, and they're now they're now on the website, uh, and you can kind of often look at committee assignments for getting a sense of like who's. Uh, up or down in the eyesights of House and Senate leadership, uh, given the way that one of the issues that committee committee chairmanships and vice chairmanships do come with extra money, as I'll talk about in a sec in, in, in a moment, as well as the rules for the session are, are are voted on. We saw that I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly, and we've seen that recently with the Senate voting on a set of rules for its own chamber, uh, joint rules for the House and Senate operating together and COVID rules around remote voting. The House has only voted on joint rules 
and punted for several months to vote on rules for its own chamber. I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues uh, there in a, in a moment, uh, but just want to give that general overview. So the, the one of the big problems in the Massachusetts legislature is what I call like the two bosses problem, right? That if you're an elected, if you're a state legislator, you have that there are two different people whom you could technically call your boss. The people who elected you are your boss in which they decide whether or not you keep your job. They can hire you by reelecting you and they can fire you by electing somebody else. But they don't determine your pay. It's in fact the people above you in the legislature who determine your pay. Because, and, and that this also creates kind of a, a dynamic of, of what makes the Senate operate somewhat more differently than the House. Even though the House and the Senate are both some, somewhat over centralized, the num they both, the, 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 the the House exists in a condition of scarcity that the Senate doesn't. And what I mean by that is that if you have the same number of committees in both, like that you have in both chambers, there are enough committees for every, for every Democratic Senator to chair some committee. They might not like the committee that they get to chair. It might have been the bottom of their preference list, but they get something. Whereas in the House, you have enough committees to dole out to make sure that you as a speaker stay in power because you have enough people loyal to you to want to keep those positions. But you, but you have a situation where several dozen people will always be on the outside. And, it, and that creates an incentive where if that chairmanship gets you $15,000, gets you $30,000 or maybe a vice chairmanship of $15,000, that's real money. And it creates, and creates an incentive structure that, it may, that makes it so that representatives increasingly view those who determine their pay as the ones that they should be taking, taking cues from, as opposed to the ones who can hire or fire them. Um, but what, you can, what can you do at the start of a legislative session? Mo so one thing that people often don't realize is most legislators don't write their own bills. Uh, very few of them actually write their own bills. Most of the bills are being written, like, are being written by advocates outside who are fighting for the legislation. And knowing that if there is an issue that you're particularly passionate about and you want to be involved with writing, writing and piece of new legislation, you can contact your legislators to address that. Um, because, or even if it's just to prompt them to write a new piece of legislation around that. Uh, contact your legislators about co-sponsoring a bill. As I'll talk about later, co-sponsorship of a bill is a first step but getting them to just get, do that first step of putting their name to something so that you can lobby them uh, to take additional steps later is important. And contacting your legislators about, about the rules is also helpful because it can, can determine what, the, what things will look like for it kind of through that, through that session about how the chamber operates. Let me see, do I have that? Just quickly seeing if I have it. I don't know, I forget if I have that on a later slide, but quickly on the, when it comes to the rules, that's another place where we often see a significant contrast between the House and the Senate, where the Senate is much more willing to be open, um, the open uh, than the House. Realize I do have this in an upcoming slide. I will talk about this shortly. Okay, if you want to talk to your legislators about our our progressive agenda, as I noted before, quick page with an action with a a link where you can uh, contact your legislators. Uh, just want to always like putting plugs for taking action. Okay, so one thing that's a significant change in the House this session is you may have encountered when lobbying state reps in the past where they say that they can't sign on to bills after the first, after let's like, say the end of January, that the House had typically had an artificial deadline imposed on itself that said that two weeks after the filing deadline is a co-sponsorship deadline and after that date, you can't sign on to any house bill again. That, that That's no longer the case, although it's still a little bit of a weird system. So if you go to any bill page, and this is the, the bill page for the Safe Communities Act, you'll see something that's, you'll see petitioners and additional co-sponsors. Anybody who signed on to this bill in that, that, that initial window is listed as a petitioner and you have to click on a page for additional co-sponsors. 
if you want to see anybody who signed after that deadline. Why they couldn't just create one page? Beyond, it's beyond me. Would make everybody's life easier. But it is better than they're limiting the with they're having a tight deadline as they did before. But also here, know that if your legislator, if your state rep is telling you that they can't co-sponsor something anymore, they're lying. I've already heard state reps trying to dissemble about that and use that initial deadline that they have as an excuse. It's not the case. As I noted before, the House and Senate both had to pass a set of joint rules setting about how the chambers will be operating for the session. Um, there are, they haven't actually finalized those, and there are a few bits of kind of difference happening right now. One is making committee votes available online. It's something that the majority of states do and that the House has been very resistant to. Uh, the House, rather than just po posting votes, wanted uh, past language to say that they would only post those who, who voted no and a final tally. And the main reason why they seem to want that is we often assume that legislators vote in committee, but they actually don't vote in committee that often because they're often given maybe an hour to read a bill and that they're told, let's say if I were to send out a bill to all of you now and say, I, by 5 p.m., tell me if you wanna vote yes or no on this. And it's a hundred page bill and I want, I want an answer in less than two hours. And maybe you're nowhere near, near a computer and you're not gonna read that bill. And you're like, you can't read that bill. So you just don't bother to vote. That's a fairly common occurrence. And if you actually had to publish every vote, you would realize how few people actually vote on any of these. And rather than one, embarrassing people by showing that, or two, actually just giving them time, they would rather just have uh, a workaround. Another thing that's at stake is making testimony accessible to the public. Some states go so far as to make this fully available online. The, what the Senate has wanted to do for the past three sessions is just simply making it accessible like any other public record. So that in the way in which anybody who's ever tried to get documents out of any government agency, that you apply, there are appropriate redactions, and then you can get things. Um, and giving people greater notice, advance notice for hearings. Uh, because it's wild how like they can call a hearing in a few days and people like, when people's week schedule is already made. Uh, and the greater notice helps people who, are, who have children or have, who have to like rearrange your work schedule if they wanna be able to participate in a hearing. Okay, how this process could be better. Uh, some idea for the beginning of the session. One, electing committee chairs. It doesn't fully reduce that centralization and power, but in the US House, they actually do elect committee chairs in the full, like for Democratic committee chairs are elected by the full Democratic caucus. So it gives some greater public sense of the process and an opportunity for people to engage. Um, you could also make co-sponsorship actually mean something. You could say, for instance, that if a majority of people co-sponsor a bill, it has to get a vote. Maybe fewer people will co-sponsor, but then we shouldn't be giving them credit <laughs> for it to actually become law. So, so budget season. Uh, and I want to make sure that I, I'll run through this, through this quickly, paying attention to time. Uh, the governor the governor introduces his budget in January. That has happened already for this year. The House will be taking up a budget in April, the Senate in May. That is a built-in part of the process. Um, if they, your legislators will often tell you that they don't pass but policy through the budget. If they ever tell that to you, know that they're lying. They do that all the time. Um, I think I don't need to make a case for progressive revenue for all of you because you're well aware of it. So I will save myself time. Um, but how to take action during the budget, the budget cycle. The fate of most budget amendments is predetermined when they get to the floor debate. But you can, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't contact legislators to lobby for things. They, they do still need to hear about, hear from you. Um, but it's also, whenever you're lobbying around amendments on a bill, it's good, if you know the lead sponsor, it's a good thing to know if they're actually planning to fight for it on the floor or not. Many of them file amendments with the clear intention of withdrawing. There might be a real strategic consideration in that if you wanna build up support and then to see if you can keep building it up and then withdrawing. But 
it's also to some extent not worth your time to do a lot of work on something if they're not even planning to fight for it. Um, so it's good to be good to be aware of that and find out if you can. One thing that's also that happens in the legislature as a way of dissembling what's going on is the process of consolidated amendments that happens, especially during the budget process in the House, but sometimes on other bills. And what that means is that they take a group of thematically re related amendments, put them all together, and then hollow them out of any content, and then have just a set, some bit of language resulting. So it often looks like that they're actually combining all of the amendments and that all of those amendments end up in the budget or bill. But you always need, if you're act tracking one of the amendments, you need to actually look at the text itself because it's often just like a few earmarks that remain out of all of these like policy amendments and important line items. And they're just completely, they're just completely dispensed of through that process, um, which just often seems intentionally confusing. Okay. Uh, so just talk a little bit about the committee process. Bills are, in, in, in the upcoming weeks, bills will be assigned to different committees, and then they will have hearings uh, at some point between now and typically next, uh, next February. The House, there are two types of committees in the legislature. There are what are often called like, like yes committees and no committees. A subject matter committee, like education, like public safety, like judiciary, is kind of a yes committee and that their goal is to advance bills, even if they don't advance as many as they should. A committee like Ways and Means uh, or Steering and Policy is in many ways, or third, Bills in Third Reading, is in many ways a no committee. They're there to put, basically to block a bunch of the bills from the other committees from ever getting to the floor. So it's important to, to remember that what happens in that first committee is only step one. And we saw that last session where the Safe Communities Act and the Work and Family Mobility Act were able to get out of their first committees, but they never got beyond that. So it's important to, that, that, it's, that they're kind of mul the multiple steps that exist in the process to getting something to the floor. If you're ever trying to follow a bill on the Massachusetts website, it, Massachusetts legislature's website, it can be somewhat confusing because note that the bill numbers do constantly change. Every time they take action on a bill, the number will they, there will be a new bill number and a new page, and it's something that they really should change because it confuses it even confuses me most of the time when I'm trying to follow something. Okay, how can you take action during this during this stage? One, it's showing up for for hearings. Note that when you're showing up for a committee hearing, when showing up for committee hearings can be a thing that we do again, <laughs> not virtually, um, that you're not just trying to communicate something to the legislators who are there, you're also communicating to the press. Because if you want the press, you, because you want to be able to help shape that public narrative about the degree of support that exists for something. Lobbying your legislators, as we all know well, like I, I like to call it lobbying politely bothering them, do that early, do that often. Um, and also have an escalating ladder of asks. We talk about that on our website, I think with some examples of things that you could make your ask a legislator to do. Getting them to co-sponsor is step one, and that's an important first step. But if they're already a co-sponsor, you wanna figure out how to make a passive supporter into an active champion. You can try seeing if they can agree to testify at the hearing, if they can agree to talk to their colleagues about a bill, if they can write to house or Senate leadership about a bill, if they're willing to speak at a public event about the bill or write, a, write an editorial about the bill, excuse me, or do other things that are more pub, that are kind of stepping up their game to try to actually organize in the building and help those organizing outside the building to make that a reality, rather than thinking adding their name to a, to a website means that their job is done. So frequently asked questions. Uh, one is do hearings even matter? Right? Is it just, is it just a kind of a, a song and dance for a bill? Is the sort of thing I would say, yeah, probably to some extent, yes and no, right? That do I think that most legislators change their minds as a result of hearings? Most of them probably don't. Some who are genuinely undecided may, but you're also, as I noted, speaking to the public narrative and trying to shape that because you don't want it to be a bunch, if you're a supporter of a bill, 
You don't want it to be a whole bunch of opponents filling the room and all of the resulting press shows how everybody hated this bill. Should I lobby committee chairs or other members of the committee beyond my own legislators? That's again, it falls into the like, yes and no uh, category where it, it, that you're always most effective when you're lobbying your own elected officials. As I noted before, since you are one of their bosses, you determine whether or not they keep their job. They, they do have to listen to you more than, they have, than somebody from the other side of the state has to listen to you. It can, again, for matters of public perception, if they're being flooded by opponents of a bill, you might want to direct people to write to the full committee just to change how they're like, so that they don't feel like they're being bombarded by opponents. They feel at least you can neutralize it to being bombarded by both sides but it's always most effective to talk to your own legislators. You'll often see bills talked about as being sent to study. Um, and that can often happen to amendments being sent to study as well. That's often just a polite way of saying that a bill is being, be, bill is being killed. The, legislators often don't like actually voting down the bills that other legislators have and sending them to study is a polite way of dispensing with them without having to say that you are so mean as to vote down your colleague's bill, but you don't want it to move forward. Um, when a bill is sent to study, it can theoretically be revived um, because it's basically kind of on, on life support, so to speak, but it's not likely to be revived during that session. And those studies never do happen. How independent are committees actually? That's a, that uh, doesn't even matter who the chair of a committee is. Again, a mix of like yes and no. If you have a fair, it's always better to have a favorable committee chair than to have somebody who like is an adamant opponent of the bill that you're fighting for. But if if House and Senate leadership want something to advance, they'll probably get find their way to advance it regardless of what a specific committee chair, chair chairman or chairwoman wants to do. How to make the process better. As I noted before, posting committee votes online and, and the fact that that might make them have to actually like give people more time to read bills as a, as a follow up. Um, one thing that other states do, I know at least California, does post reader friendly version, like summaries of bills so that you actually know what they're voting on as, as a member of the public and track changes edits so you can see what happens to a bill at each stage as well as either publishing testimony or simply testifiers so that you know who's on either side and can figure out what's actually at stake. Floor debate, I'm sure you all know that the value of having recorded votes, as I like to say, a core part of uh, uh, kind of a grassroots lobbying is always trying to get receipts from everything that you do, from what you're asking legislators uh, to do for you. And that's a core uh, part of, of having recorded votes. It's, there's, a, there's something clearly at stake. Legislators have a choice of either voting yes or voting no, and it's a tool to hold them accountable afterwards. Because it's a tool to hold them accountable, they don't like doing it very often. Uh, and then you have a situation where many recorded votes are either party line or unanimous. That's slow, that, that wasn't always the case. It became much more the case under House Speaker Robert DeLeo. It started to change last session, and it will require work to continue that to continue to be the case so that the house so that it's less of a top down body from a cultural perspective, uh, in addition to the various built in built in incentives. So how can you take action once that bill has already gotten its way to the floor. Uh, that you can lobby your legislators about the bill or any amendments to it, as I noted, if your state rep or state senator is filing an amendment see if they actually plan to stand for it and fight for its passage and to see and to figure out if it's worth rallying people behind it or not. Um, and then if you don't talk about how your legislators are voting, how will anyone know how they vote? Uh, and that's kind of a core process of, of the accountability component of, of having uh, recorded votes, that it gives that opportunity to provide positive reinforcement or kind of more so like more like critical accountability, that's the only way to make change. Um, the one of the general lines about making change in the legislature that I like to say that it is our job to move people as much as we can. And if we can't move them any further to remove them. And that's a critical, a critical part of that step of that process. 
So how do you make, how can you make that process better? One, as a, le legislators should have more time to read bills. There have been times when, particularly in the House, the t it'll be announced the morning of that you're voting on this bill at 2 p.m. today and nobody has read it. And then only afterwards are activists able to point out how terrible the thing they just voted for was. But it's also important to know that sometimes when legislators complain about not having enough time to read bills, they're, call they're giving you BS and they weren't planning to vote. If they use that as an excuse for voting no, Sometimes they weren't planning to ever vote yes anyway, and they weren't even in play for voting yes. So no one, no one to call BS. And as I noticed, it's important to have that ongoing work of, of cultural change in the body, of being able to give legislators more of a backbone so that they know that their constituents and the kind of, and the kind of activist communities want them to actually stand for something, both literally and, figure, literally and figuratively, and will have their back when they, when they take, take hard votes that are important. So what happens actually after a bill passes? So after a bill passes, uh, and, and if, if both the House and the Senate pass a bill, you have what's called a conference committee. That means you get two Democrats and one Republican from the Senate, and two Democrats and one Republican from the House and they basically have to go into a room together and negotiate the final details. First of all, that overrepresents Republicans who probably don't really deserve even their one on both given their numbers in the chamber. But can, the question that people often ask is, can I lobby a conference committee? If one of your own legislators is on one, one definitely do so. It's always, as I noted before, it's always more effective to lobby your own legislators than other legislators. You can still write to members of the conference committee. It's still useful for shaping their perception of things, but it's always going to be more effective if they're your own legislators. And people often will ask, can I find out what this conference committee is even doing? For the most part, no, because they're often kept as somewhat of a black box that you might have people who can give you gossip and figure out to pry a little bit of details about how negotiations are going. But it's often very difficult to know what exactly that is going on. And is why it's important to keep the debate about an issue in the public as pressure for them to both pass something and for them to pass something as strong as possible. Okay, uh, and I'll be quick so I wanna allow people to ask questions. So I'm gonna wrap up these few slides. So what power does the governor actually have? When, the, when a bill gets sent to the governor, that he can, he or, or hopefully some, at some point she can choose one of four steps. Uh, one, sign the bill, governor signs the bill, it becomes law. The governor can choose to veto the bill in full or in, in certain cases in part, like uh, you can partially do line item vetoes of a budget. And then it goes back to the legislature and the legislature needs two thirds to override. The governor can choose to do nothing I mentioned before the difference between a formal session and an informal session. If they're in a formal session and he does nothing, it becomes law by his own inaction. If they're not in session, that's called a pocket veto. They don't have the people there to override and his inaction kills the bill. He can also, as was exemplified recently with the climate bill, send back amendments that the legislature then has to consider. I'll skip over this slide, but note that I do have a, we do have a page on our website with frequently heard excuses from legislators, uh, because legislators are many things, but they are not creative in their excuses. Um, and I'll talk about my key takeaways and then take some questions because I've done a lot of talking. Um, one, with everything, I always like reminding people that 90% of politics is just showing up. And so that speaks to the importance of kind of organizing in communities and kind of contacting legislators and a phone call is more valuable than an email and showing up in person is more valuable than a phone call because every step is a, is a way of showing your legislator whether or not you can out hustle them because they're often afraid of eventually losing their seat. And the more people you can bring to a meeting or a public event, you're showing you could actually out hustle them. Um, always ask for receipts. If it, your legislators say that they're gonna do something, make sure they actually do. Um, you never have to vote to change the culture. We talked about, I briefly spoke about different rules changes that are, would make the legislature work better. But 
people can also start making a less centralized and less toxic culture of the building on their own by just actually working on cultural change. Um, never feel afraid uh, about that you don't know enough about something when you're lobbying your legislators. They are mostly experts on nothing. And that's an important thing to realize that you are probably more of an expert than they are on a number of key issues. And that those who are experts on things are often not even used well. Um, and then if a vote occurs and no one talks about it, did it even happen? Uh, just speaks to the value of being able to publicize what's happening in the legislature, especially since it's often hard to follow what's going on. And the more people can amplify what's happening and offer tools for accountability, the more people you can engage and help to make change. So I hope, hope hopefully that was useful. Uh, I just I'm gonna end that, but I would love to take any questions that people have because that was kind of a dump of information. John, how much of a difference does it make who sponsors your bill? That's that's a really good question. So that I think it that there are definitely it definitely makes somewhat of a difference because there are let if more if your legislator is somebody who's generally well liked by their colleagues, it probably does help help you to get co get sponsors for your bill. It's something where having somebody who's really well connected in the building is not a guarantee for passage. It can still like that we saw that last session where Paul, where Paul Donato, who is one of the top ranking Democrats was the lead sponsor for the uh, emergency paid sick time bill and it didn't go in, and it ultimately got pulled and didn't go anywhere. So it's not a one for one, but it, pro but if you were, but it does increase the, increase the probability of a bill, bill advancing. Just given if you, especially if you think about how legislators are at the end of the day, human beings and are both in both the good ways and the bad ways of that, if they are not petty against the person filing a bill, and if they like the person filing a bill and want to help them move up, that will ultimately help. That does lead to the bill having better odds. Question, um, John, uh, on this uh, timeline, um, when the bills begin in January and February, uh, can they go through that entire process you described at, at any time? I mean, you know, theoretically in three months, four months or, or whatever, you know, because we always observe a lot that it's, you know, the last 12 hours of a session. Yeah. You hear. But can it get it done any time? I have a, another question. That yeah. You can, can remember them. Yeah. Um, and also what happens? Um, it's, a, it's a whole two year process, if I've got mm -hmm. that correctly. And yeah. then at the end of the two year, uh, you know, those that didn't get addressed, or, does everything wash away? And start completely new again. And if a and if a bill did go through the whole process and got a no, can you keep filing it every year? So those are my questions. Ex excellent questions. So if your bill, if it, the end of the session happens and your bill if it was sent to study or voted down, I like to say that all these bills will rise like the ashes from a phoenix at the start of the next legislative session when people will file them again. That there are times that if a bill goes down, that sometimes that if a bill gets, if something gets voted down last session, it's less likely that it will go anywhere in the next session, but that's just if it gets voted down in a floor vote. That, that there's, that like, it still, it doesn't mean it's not worth advocating on, but it means it's less likely that it will move in the next next session. Um, especially if there was a lot of push around something and it, and it doesn't get, get the votes. Um, in terms of, Definitely true how so much happens in the final few days of a legislative session. Although most bills as noted, are filed at, at the start, you can, they can also file bills during the session at different points. Um, it's just the ma vast majority of them in the, in the beginning. And often the bills that come out through the session at later points stem from them taking a whole bunch of related bills, throwing them together and calling them something new. Uh, is what a number of the times when bills advance where, where legislators will be like, well, these 10 bills are on this issue. We're combining them, putting the text that we want, and we're advancing it. And it, which can make it somewhat difficult to actually follow what's going on in those bills. Um, but it's, I can have an item time. As well, sometimes the whole process gets scrambled where they, they don't, although every bill filed at the start of the session needs a hearing, if they, if they create their bill on its own outside of that process, it's not guaranteed the same degree uh, of like 
of, kind of, of being assigned to a committee and then a hearing. Uh, like with the, the police reform bills from last summer, those kind of just went straight out of a, from like a working group onto the floor rather than having a working group to ways and means to the floor rather than having like a formal hearing and then all of the multi-steps of the process. To Jim's question, they do, most, every bill does, but most bills like nobody really testifies on and they're always combined. That's a great question. If I, does every bill get a hearing? They typically get thematically joined. So it'll be, and so you can sometimes have like a hundred bills for one hearing, uh, which it makes it very difficult if you actually have like a small bill in there that's very important. But that, that's the way that they end up doing it. The, some of the more high profile bills will get a, a hearing devoted to just that bill. Like something like the Safe Communities Act will get a, a hearing on just itself. But many of the smaller bills, like if it's just, let's say, if this was something for the town of Dedham and for that, and just like a local thing, it can just be thrown in with a whole bunch of local things there's not going to be a whole bunch of people testifying. Sharon. Okay, so in terms of influencing a legislator, mm -hmm. like, would it be better for someone like me to say, I'm, I work with Progressive Mass with Sir Roxbury Roslindale? Or, you know, like a lot of the people that are here. Yeah. They, they're involved in legislative stuff because they're in, they're working in organizations. Yeah. So, so I have my question about that because if I call their office, I'm not going to get, you know, the, the, my Senator or. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but I really want to have a conversation with them about the feelings I have and why. Yeah. I, so, so there's that. And the other thing is, can we get a link to your. Uh, PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yes, I can do. And okay. I will. Um, I'll put a, a link to the PowerPoint in the, in the chat right now. As a, I'll make a view version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that it if you, it can it can often help. I, I think in saying if you if you are work 